So I'm so happy that you are here in such a big number, and I'm uh, as well, or uh, multiple times, happy because I can have Steve here as the first uh, presenter. And before he just starts in, let me just share a little experience, or ex yeah, a little experience uh, on what Steve for me, uh, because that's uh, that's an experience I guess everyone should have a, in uh, in his life at least once. So. Imagine that you are quite successful in what you do and you believe you are a good IT guy and you are a good developer and you understand what JavaScript is since you are doing that for like 20 years. So you probably believe you, you, you have a quite a good grip on what you are and you understand the whole scenery. So you believe you are Joda or Yoda. And uh, that's a good feeling and I guess everybody feels himself on that. Uh, if, you, if you do a couple of start startups and exit them uh, successfully, that, also gives to this feeling, so you feel yourself quite there, and on top of the whole thing, and then you meet Steve. And when you meet Steve, you, you just realize you are, you are Luke Skywalker on, uh, on Dagoba, but there, there's potential in you, obviously, but you are definitely not Joda and, or Yoda, because that's Steve, and uh, I am really I, appreciating that Steve was uh, the guy for me in my life. That when I was 40, I started learning again things. And that's very good. So when, when you when you really get to into an environment where you can learn, that's that's a, that's an amazing feeling. And having Steve as a tutor and guide on those things is especially amazing. So I'm, I'm so happy that this happened that I could meet uh, or I, I met Steve and uh, I understand how deep enterprise JavaScript can be because well he is the guy who knows it. So please. Uh, have Steve's presentation on uh, 12 factor apps and a little bit of Kubernetes and uh, Node.js and then anytime, uh, so how would you like the questions after yeah. it, during it? Yeah, during is fine. Yep. So anytime you would want to have a question and you are not, uh, uh, well, uh, if, you, if you are scared enough to, uh, to ask, just tell to me or the guy next to you and uh, don't be scared. <laughs> All right, so. Well, thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> um, now I'm very embarrassed. Can everybody, uh, <laughs> can everybody hear me at the back? Is that okay? Yeah, good. <clears throat> Great. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for coming to listen to me talk about enterprise-grade microservices. Well, I realise that that's a bit of a contradiction in terms because the driving factor of moving towards microservices is to get away from enterprise software development and all the slowness and heavy weight tools that come with it. Uh, and don't worry, I feel exactly the same way. So to me, what this talk's actually about, it's about craftsmanship. Because when people started talking about microservices around five years ago, um, there was this idea that because they're small, they're 500 lines, or sorry, 50 lines, 100 lines, uh, because they don't change, then you don't really need to worry about them as much as you would have done if it was a monolithic application that you had to develop over, over a five-year period. And that's partially true, but not completely. Um, so if your microservices have business logic in them, then they're going to change. If there's government regulation um, that's stored within a microservice somewhere and they introduce new regulation, then it's going to change. And so I do think craftsmanship is actually very, very important for microservices. Now, thankfully, some pretty smart guys already came up with a, a very good set of principles uh, for how to build enterprise-grade software. Um, and that's what Peter was talking about when he said the 12-factor apps. And so what I plan to do is to walk through one of the microservices that we wrote recently and talk through how we were influenced by these principles. Um, which ones aren't relevant anymore as far as I'm concerned? Uh, which tools satisfied them best, and if there was a gap uh, in the tool chain, what we did to fill that gap. So the client that we wrote this microservice for was Utility Warehouse. Um, they make their money, and they make an awful, awful lot of money, about 750 million pounds a year turnover, by buying utilities, so energy, electricity. Uh, I've made that. <laughs> 
az, az 400 milliárd forint, vagy kicsivel a fölött, az ilyen nemzetgazdasági tétel, mi nálunk. It's a size in Hungarian government uh, and the economy size that's actually a, a big piece in the yearly uh, slicing of the uh, GDP. So it's a big money for us. Yeah, and it's big money for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they make their money by um, buying utilities, electricity, gas, mobile phone, broadband, and they buy it wholesale at a massive discount. Uh, and then they resell it to residential and corporate customers um, at a markup, but still passing on some of the discounts. Uh, and the other benefits for their customers are that they get a single bill rather than multiple bills from different suppliers, and they have a single call center. So we're actually in a utility warehouse replacing their billing system. Um, but as part of that, we've had to be looking into the, the utility data that comes in. Um, so when we're, we're addressing the, the mobile feed, uh, they asked us, well, look, we, we really need um, some help. Um, can you write us uh, a service that shows the, the number of calls, text messages, and the amount of data that people have used in the month? Essentially, this, this service, the, the usage uh, summary service. Now, this is, this is I'm, I'm no graphic designer or, or UX consultant. This is just me mocking something up. The real app doesn't look like this. But essentially, the, the purpose of this app is that because they want to be able to warn their customers when they're about to exceed um, their allowances and their customers are going to start to incur costs. Um, so the, the app is relatively simple. We just need to take uh, an import of some uh, fairly large XML files from EE uh, and then split them up, uh, aggregate the data by uh, telephone number, by event, uh, voice, text message or data uh, and by month and then provide a RESTful feed on top of that. It gets a little bit more complicated because we need to work out whether that event um, should be uh, considered in the allowance or not. Uh, because if, if you make a, a premium rate phone call, then it doesn't come out of your, your allowance. But if you make a call to someone in the EU, then it does. So the first uh, of the 12 factor app principles is code base. Uh, a single code base tracked in revision control with many deploys. And it's a bit of a strange principle to start with because I'm not really sure it's relevant anymore. Um, the, the idea behind it, I, I suspect, was that if you've ever worked in uh, a fairly old enterprise uh, shop uh, and you, you joined a project and you said, right, I, I'd like to get started and you check out um, the, the application code and then to find out that that wasn't enough, you needed to check out some more libraries as well, and then you had to check out some build scripts, and you had to check out some Apache configuration because you wanted to run this thing up locally. Um, then it was like two or three days, and you might actually have this application running. And so I suspect that's what they were talking about. But today, uh, people do have um, multiple code bases, so you, you would have sorry, uh, uh, multiple applications in a single GitHub repository. Um, Google do that with, with one of the repos. So this one I'm not too fussed about. The next one we get for free with Node. Uh, explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. So with Node, when you install a module, um, you put it into package.json, um, there you go, it's been declared, uh, and it's isolated in your Node modules directory. If you want to go a bit deeper, um, you can use shrink wrap, and then you get the explicit dependency, and you get all the transitive dependencies declared as well. Um, and if you're using Docker, and that's how we do all of our deployments, and you've got any native libraries that you need to install, so for this, for this application we use uh, a native Postgres driver and we also need a, a time zone info file uh, installed. That goes in your Docker file and so it's declared there. So again, not very much to talk about with this principle. The third one gets a bit more interesting. Store config in the environment. Now, according to the 12-factor apps, you should only ever use environment variables for your config, and you shouldn't group them um, by environment name like production or staging. And I think that's a very naive view. Uh, and the reason is that one of the major causes of bugs in production systems is misconfiguration. Uh, and so what I want to do is get as much of that configuration in with my source code as, as possible. It can still be in a, a external files, JSON files, uh, JavaScript files. Um, but I want to make sure that when I deploy that application, that, that there's much of the configuration is being deployed with it. So if I have to roll the application back, 
I don't want to be messing around with config with environment variables. I want to know that the rollback is going to roll back my configuration as well. And so my approach to configuration is I start off with a, a file called fault.js. And I use JavaScript rather than JSON because I want to be able to put comments in there, or sometimes I want to be able to actually write some code. Um, but on top of that, I will layer an environment file. And so uh, in, in this case, it would be identified by an environment variable that was set uh, to the deployment environment. So locally, it would be local.js, or in production, it would be production.js. And so both these files would exist. And how I would, I would load the config and I would merge them together with everything in production.js overriding everything in default, anything in default.js. Now, both these files get checked in, and I don't want to be checking in uh, passwords. So I would have a third file, secrets.json, and secrets.json doesn't go into GitHub. Um, that's managed and encrypted somewhere else. We're using Kubernetes, and it supports this. And so what Kubernetes does, it will uh, manage our secrets file, and it will mount it into the Docker container at deployment time. And then if I do need anything, any special configuration, then I'll do that with command line arguments um, or environment variables, potentially. Uh, and again, Kubernetes supports those options. So what we have here is essentially a tier of configuration sources. And I don't think you have to limit it to these four. Potentially, you might want to get some configuration from etc.d because that will notify you of changes and so you can pick them up. Now, there are tools for doing um, this sort of thing with Node. Uh, I used to use Nconf for it, but they're a bit cumbersome. So the first demo I'm, I'm going to give is of a tool called Confabulous. Right. Can you read that at the back? Good. So... <laughs> So here's my <coughs> default.js, and it contains almost all the settings I need for this service. I'll highlight the, the server port um, and the transport. We're using Bunyan, um, so we, we love this JSON in all of our AWS environments. And if I show you our local override, well, I don't want to log using Bunyan locally because I'm a human being and it's not very readable. Um, so I, I use a different transport. I log to uh, something that's human friendly. And I might as well show production while I'm here. So if we look at production, see there, they have different host users uh, and a, a different database, but no passwords. So if I start this up, and hopefully you can see this, you'll see there, Confabulous is looking for default.json, and it loads it. Further down, it loads local.json, oh, sorry, J J JavaScript. It looks for secrets, but locally I don't need a secrets file, um, so it doesn't worry about that. You can see here that it starts on 3002. So if I say minus minus server dot port 5000, the command line argument has overridden that, um, and we're now starting to port 5000 instead. If I copy my conf local.js to conf demo.js, and let's say I comment out the transport, I say, I'm going to start again. But this time I say uwm equals demo. We should now be logging as JSON rather than uh, as readable text. Now, Confabulous does have a couple um, more tricks up its sleeve. Actually, I should show you how, how it's set up first. So, So, what's required to get Confabulous working? Um, you 
instantiate it. And then you add in your tiers of config. Uh, and loaders require, that really just does a, a require under the hood. And so here I'm requiring in default.js, there I'm requiring in whatever is resolved um, for the uwm.js. Here's my secrets, and mandatory is false. Uh, and here are my command line arguments. Now, it supports environment variables. There are plugins available for vault, uh, if you want to store secrets in vault. Um, and there's plugins for etcd as well. So the other trick that you can do with Confabulous is you can watch config sources. So if I say here, so if I attach an event listener to the reloaded event, and fire that up, and then I change local, something in local.js, it doesn't matter what it is. Hopefully, there you go. So all I did is I attached a, a console log to the reloaded event, and so as soon as I changed that file, um, it emitted the new config. Now, Confabulous doesn't actually change or do anything with that reloaded config, because it would be dangerous. So you wouldn't want, for example, if you're halfway through servicing an HTTP request to suddenly change the config mid-flow. So what I tend to do to this event, or do with this event, is I will gracefully stop and restart the application. Uh, and therefore, picking up all of the new configuration, by gracefully, I mean I wait until any in-flight requests have been completed. So that's confabulous. That's how we do our configuration. The, the next subject um, are treating logs as event streams. And I'm sorry if you can't quite see this at, at the back. So um, I find it much better just to write your, your logs as JSON to std out or std error, um, which is the, the 12 factor principle. But we go one step further because I think that log messages should actually be treated as events. Uh, so we use a library called Prepper, which provides uh, a log like API over. Uh, nodes event emitter. Um, and the reason we do this is because a, a log event might need more than one consumer. And so one of the consumers in our case is um, Bunyan to log out as, as JSON. But we use Prometheus for our metrics. And so if you think about what this application does, we import an XML file with thousands and thousands of events in it. We, we go through those events and we transform them and we aggregate them. Um, and the thing that we log after that is that, yeah, we, we just processed 5,000 events and it took three seconds. Now, that's, that's something that's suitable to log out, to stood out, but it's also something that I want to start graphing and capturing as part of my metric system. So because we use Node's event emitter for our logging, we can have two consumers. And the, the third consumer we have um, is sometimes our tests. So we have a, another task that goes through and deletes data after three and a half months. Uh, and again, we want to know how many records did we delete and how long did it take. Um, but we have a test that says that um, under the conditions where there was no data older than three, three and a half months, um, does the application still function correctly? But there are no side effects. If there's, if there's nothing to delete, then you can't really assert the, the contents of the database. Um, so what we do is we listen to that event and we assert that yes, okay, the event triggered and then there are no records found. Next up we have backing services. So treat backing services as attached resources. So if this is your application, um, then a backing service might be a database or it might be a RESTful feed. And we have both of these with the usage summary. We have a, a database Postgres and we have another service that we use to tell us whether a, um, a, a telephone number is an EU number or not. So the way we handle backing services um, locally is we use Docker Compose. So I'm guessing people have, have started using um, Docker by now and probably seen Docker Compose too, but I'll show it anyway. So here we are, here's our Docker Compose file. Um, this is how we set up 
uh, a Postgres container locally, and this is how we set up the ref data container, which tells us whether a telephone number belongs to the EU or not. And if I say Docker PS, you'll see both of those images running. And so to get this application's backing services working locally, I'll just shut them down. Nothing running. So there we go. There's our Postgres instance and there's our ref data instance. Now ref data is just another service and just another microservice that we write and we build. Because we build them into Docker images, they're easy to run locally. And I know that Peter's actually, he, he claimed that he's, he's not Yoda, but he's actually looking at running these with Docker Swarm in AWS rather than locally. So the next uh, principle is export services via port binding. And this is, again, something else that you get virtually for free with Node. What this was talking about was uh, in the days of enterprise Java applications where you would build IR files and deploy them to an application server, that just made things very, very hard to test and to run locally. Uh, and so it was considered better to embed your web server within your application using something like Jetty. Uh, and Node does that. If you use Express or if you use Happy, it's your process which calls and starts Happy or Express. So there's nothing to talk about there. Uh, and this one, execute the app as one or more stateless processes. This just means um, <coughs> don't use in-memory sessions because they don't scale and don't use sticky load balancers. So again, not much there. But this principle I found very, very interesting. Increase concurrency by scaling out the process model. So this application, um, I'm sorry for the guys at, at the back. Um, this application, or is it this microservice, uh, locally we just run one instance of. Uh, and the idea was that when we released it to production, we would run probably two or three instances of it um, for resilience. Um, and then when pretty soon into development, we realized that we couldn't run it like this because these XML files were so big that they could take up to 30 seconds to process. Um, and the trouble with that is that parsing XML in Node is a synchronous activity, it's blocking. And so if we deploy this as a single service, even, even in multiple instances, what we're going to do is the minute we hit one of these really big XML files, we're no longer going to be able to accept HTTP requests and serve up our RESTful summary. And it doesn't matter how many of these services we deploy, eventually we're going to hit this problem. So what we did is we split the service. We didn't split the code base, we just deployed it multiple times. So locally, it's still easy to, to run. You just run this thing up, you can have end-to-end -end tests that import and that provide a summary. But when we deploy it, we actually deploy six instances of the container and we can configure them to behave differently. So the first set just deals with the XML import. It takes a, a big XML file and it stores it into a database and returns a 204 and does nothing else. The, the middle set, the transform step, well, that watches the database, it picks out the XML, it goes through taking the 30 seconds to parse and aggregate and do all those other sorts of things with it, and then writes, it in, writes the summary into another table. And then the API services, they read the summary table to provide a feed. Now, because these are running as completely different containers, different mm -hmm. processes, um, the, the slow transform step doesn't block either of the other two. Now, we had a, a debate about whether we should really be deploying this as three microservices with three code bases? And I think the answer is no, because there's still an overarching responsibility to provide a usage summary service. Uh, and if we had have done that, then we would have been integrating by database. We'd have had multiple services going to the same set of tables, the same schema. And we would have also had to find a way of sharing our domain model, um, either duplicating it or putting it into a module and coupling these things. So I actually think that this idea of uh, configuring your app to be run in multiple modes is very powerful. We got some extra benefits too. So the first time we came to deploy this, we wanted to do some proper load testing. And we needed to load a month's worth of data, which if you imagine the utility warehouse have, have about 600,000 customers, you can imagine how many phone calls, text message, data events, 600,000 people make in a month. It's, it's really quite a large amount of data. And it was all stored in S3 uh, as backups. And that's not particularly the fastest data store either. So what we did is when we were importing, 
we scaled up these processes. We increased the number of them. Uh, increase the number of import and transform containers, and that's just a parameter to Kubernetes. And so they flew through in about five hours, and then we scaled them back down again. We ran our load tests, and we found out that we had a problem, that the database was running hotter than we expected it to. I had a hunch, it turned out to be wrong, but I, I had a hunch that it was going to be something to do with the transformer when it was inserting the records. So we killed those containers. The application still worked, they still served an API, it still imported data, it just didn't do the middle bit. Didn't solve the problem, it ended up being a Postgres picking the wrong index, and so we brought them back up again. So being able to decouple these, these particular tasks is really useful, and if you do a rollout and something goes wrong in your transformation, your API still works. So that was very, very, very powerful. Another principle, run maintenance tasks as one-off processes, sort of fits into this. So a maintenance task could be to import this, these, these files for the first time, or it could be to do a data fix. And so when we have something like that, well, we put all the code within the same code base, and we treat it just as any other process. Fire it up, it uses the same configuration, and when it's done, it terminates. So now we get into the um, build. You already know that I use Docker to do the build. Um, but we're using Kubernetes, I've mentioned we're using Kubernetes too. So let's walk through some of that. Here's our Docker file. It's based on Alpine. These are the, I mentioned that we're using some native libs. We are using shrink wrap. Um, I'm not too worried about pinning down transitive dependencies. The reason we use shrink wrap and we explicitly copy shrink wrap into our uh, image um, early on and follow it with package.json is so that we can use Docker's cache. Um, so when we're doing the npm install, if this was uncached, it would be quite slow. It's got to go and download all of your dependencies from npm. By copying in shrink wrap here and package.json here, if nothing in the contents of either of one of these files has changed, then the npm install comes from Docker's cache and is lightning quick. The minute we introduce a new dependency, you're guaranteed that shrink wrap is going to change, which will bust the cache, and so now the install will go and do its proper job. So that's how we get builds down to about 20 seconds, including running the tests. So we use Circle as our, uh, Circle CI as our build server. Um, it's not very good. Uh, or at least it doesn't fit our purpose very well, I should say. Um, the issues with it are that they take quite a long time to update their, um, their, their VMs, and so we can't actually use Docker Compose in it without jumping through an awful lot of hoops. So we have to start Postgres explicitly, and we have to start our ref data container explicitly. So once we've waited for our backing services to come up, we install a module that we wrote called kube deploy which simplifies deployments using Kubernetes. We pull down the previous version of the summary service, and the reason we do that is because Circle gives us a new virtual machine each time. And so there's no previous build of the image there that we could use for cache. And it's an awful lot faster to pull down um, the last built image rather than to build afresh again. So here we're doing our build tagging it as the UW service mobile usage summary and versioning it using the circle SHA. Now that's just the Git SHA, so all of our images are versioned using the Git commit. We run our tests, once we've built the image, we run our tests inside the container. We uh, specify the, the build environment, link in the ref data and the Postgres containers, and then run npm test. And in this way, what we deploy to production is exactly the same code base that was tested. We tag our image as latest, push it to our registry, and now here is the three deploys. And so this npm run deploy is a wrapper for kube deploy. When we do a, a Kubernetes deployment, um, what happens is that Kubernetes holds a manifest file for these services in memory. Excuse me. And uh, we send it an HTTP patch request to patch that manifest file with the newly built version. So the only thing that actually changes 
in the manifest phallus is circle sharp, but that's enough to tell Kubernetes that something has changed, and so go and redeploy those containers. And we deploy three times, once for each one of those processes I showed you on the previous diagram. There's our imports, which is the, the XML importer. Jobs is the, the middle step, the transform step, because we have a couple of other um, long-running tasks that we, we shove into that container, such as deleting old data and a retry task. And that's our usage API. So if I show you the, what the Kubernetes manifest looks like, there we go, it's a big long YAML file. Right at the top we define a load balancer and you can see that anything to slash usage or slash history um, will go to our usage API. History is just three months worth of usage. Uh, but our imports will go to our import service. This is the definition for our usage API. 3002. There are, here we go. This is how you tell Kubernetes what image to use for the container. And this is slightly misleading, it says latest in here, but you've got to remember that Kubernetes holds an in-memory version of this file. And so when we deploy with Circle, we send that patch request with the new container version. This is what's being replaced. You can set resource limits. And now one of the really nice features of Kubernetes is this concept of probes. So you have two types of probe, a live, liveness probe and a readiness probe. A liveness probe just means that the, the process has started, that the container has started. The readiness probe means that actually it's ready for business. And so we set a, a URL that's a, a real URL, we'll get a genuine JSON response from this in a 200. And so when this, Kubernetes will keep polling this URL, and that's how it knows when your container has actually started and the process within it is ready to, for business. And it's only then that it will start sending, redirecting traffic from the load balancer to this container. The other thing that's very smart about Kubernetes is that when you're doing a redeployment, what it will do is shut down all but one of your previous containers. Deploy a complete new set of the new version. And then when the first one of those passes its readiness check, it's only then will it will terminate the last version of the previous container. This is how we set our environment variable, our UWM. And this is how we mount in our secrets. So, the only thing that really to show you here is with the, the jobs service, how we tell our job service that it's got to run these background tasks. And so we use our command line arguments to override them. If I flip back to default.js, you'll see here that all of our background jobs are disabled by default. And the only place that they're enabled command line arguments to the to this uh, sort of container that's running in the jobs mode. So because it's only dev, I'll do a deployment now. So if we say kube control get pods, these are all the um, services running um, the mobile user summary. So there's two instances of imports, two instances of our jobs. There's something called the Kafka adapter, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's the, the usage API. So the Kafka adapter, uh, I didn't trust the, the node Kafka uh, libraries. Uh, and so we wrote this one in Go. These, these XML files, they arrive um, via uh, Kafka bus um, and we, we have a Go service that receives them and then posts them to our, our service. So if I was to, uh, so I should also say that all of these have passed their readiness check, one, one of one, and apart from the ones that I've been playing around with today, they've all been running for quite some time. So it's one day, six days, 16 days. If I make a change to the manifest file, I 
if I say hoop apply minus f if filling provider on quick, you will see that what it's done it doesn't touch these guys because it knows they haven't changed. But it's left this one running, that's still been running for a day. It started two new containers, but they haven't passed their readiness check yet. But now they have, so it's terminated the old version of the container. And it's running with these two guys, they've been up for 24 seconds, 25 seconds. So that's how we do our deployments. So all of this satisfies this next principle of maintaining dev and production parity. Locally, we run in containers which are as close as possible to what's going to be running in production. In our staging and production environments, we deploy exactly the same images using Kubernetes, um, and our AWS environments are configured with Terraform. So we have a, a really high degree of dev parity. So the last principle, embrace disposability with fast startup and graceful shutdown. Now, this one is my, my personal favorite um, because this is really where you start to talk about craftsmanship. If you think about this service, it's, it's got a RESTful API. And what happens when we redeploy this service? Well, Kubernetes is gonna tell Docker to stop a container. That's gonna cause a SIG term to be sent to the node process. If we don't do anything with that SIG term, the process is just going to stop. Any in-flight requests at the time it stops are going to be killed, they're going to be cut short. And the client that initiates those requests is going to receive an error. And the chances are it's going to log that error and then abort whatever it was doing. Some of our clients do 20 live deployments a day. And you can imagine sort of the, the noise in that infrastructure of errors and requests being aborted at any point. So microservices really need to be good citizens. They, they shouldn't behave in this way. So what you need to do is make sure that when you get that, that sick term, you're, you're listening for it. And that the first thing you do is you stop accepting new uh, connections, new, new HTTP requests. But you must allow the in-flight ones to complete. And then when they've completed, you terminate any, or you disconnect from any backing resources, you've got any databases, and it's only then that you stop. And a similar thing for when you, when you deploy and when you start up. Make sure that you establish connections to your backing services first before starting to receive either messages from a queue or from an HTTP request. It sounds fairly simple, but it's actually subtly difficult. Because once you start doing microservices at scale, and some of the organizations we work with have over 100, uh, and multiple development teams. Well, the first thing is that this has got to enter into the consciousness of busy development teams. They've got to realize that this is important. You don't notice it when you're running locally. And the second thing that you have to start worrying about is that in a microservice environment, you can be using all sorts of data stores or, or message brokers. So at, at one of our clients, Tez, we have Mongo, we have Redis, we have Postgres, we have MySQL, uh, they have Cassandra, they have Rabbit, and so, Writing the startup and shutdown code for, all, or for any combination of any of those ends up being really quite ugly. And so we tackled this by creating a component called Systemic. So what Systemic will do, it will listen for those events for you and it will control, it will let you express the order of dependencies within your application. So you, you would say that your server depends on your database and then Systemic will make sure that they're started and stopped in the right order. So, in systemic, we, we think of a microservice as a system of components. I'll show you that in a minute. And systemic has a runner, and it's the runner which starts the system. So here we go, we, we initialize the runner by passing a system to it, and we call start. 
Now what the runner does in the background, it just calls system.start, but it sets up those event listeners for sig term and sig int. And also it will listen for an error event, because if anything in your application emits an error, it will otherwise crash your node process. And when it receives any of those events, it calls system.stop, uh, and that's it. So most of the magic happens in the, in the system. So here we have our system. And a system is comprised of components. Now, a component can be just a normal object. This is package.json that we're, we're acquiring. Um, but in the case of anything with a server component or anything like a database, we wrap that in a, a very, very, very lightweight wrapper that has optionally a start and optionally a stop method. So if we have a look at somewhere in here, there'll be a, a Postgres. There we go. Require systemic PG. So all this is, it's just a wrapper around the PG library that exposes a start and a stop. And then further down here, we define all of the components within the system. And the order that we add them in doesn't matter. But if I scroll right to the bottom, work, bottom up, you see here we have a server component. Now that's just express server. And it depends on config and it depends on a logger and all sorts of other things. But one of them is roots. So those are just your express roots. Now roots depends on store. Store is just our data access tier, which depends on Postgres. Postgres depends on a migrator, and here the migrator is, and that just depends on config, and config's fabulous. So what happens when we tell this system to start? It will make sure that it starts config first, that's asynchronous, it could be loading it from any number of sources. After that, it will start our migrator, and the migrator applies any schema changes that we have. Now at this point, the Express isn't running. The database, our database connections that we're, we're using in our store haven't been established. We're blocking those because they're depending on the migrator being finished. Once the migration is done, we start Postgres. After the Postgres instance has got us all its connections, we can start our store, and then when that's ready, we can start roots, Finally, we can start server and start accepting HTTP requests. And then we, when we come to shut down the application, systemic will do this in reverse order. So, here's systemic, adding all of these components. Now the first thing it starts is the config. And somewhere down in this list of stuff, there will be starting a migrator. And then further down, it's going to start Postgres. And right at the bottom of this list, it starts our server. Now, if I send this to SIG interrupt, it's caught that, and now it stops our server. And Express is smart enough when you say a server.close to stop listening for new connections but to allow the in-flight ones to complete. And so once our server has stopped, we will continue stopping all those other components in reverse order. So there's Postgres, somewhere down right at the bottom will be our configuration. And now the system can safely terminate. So that's how we make sure that our microservices behave as good citizens and don't cut off in-flight requests just because we're redeploying them. So, we went to a, a lot of trouble with this service, most of this, this stuff we had from before. Uh, and what happened? This is our first service at Utility Warehouse, uh, and we went live, and, well, nothing. It was, uh, the, the service worked. There was no excitement, there was no drama, there was no panic, because we'd followed these 12 factor principles, and we'd used craftsmanship to ins ensure that we're delivering good quality software. But I don't like to end on a, on a downer. And I mentioned earlier that we use Prometheus uh, and Grafana um, for our metrics. So all the green is just business as usual. This, this is us importing things. This is a, a, a sort of a, a report over the last 30 days. And these are our error events, the, the number of things that went wrong. And in the last 30 days, we've had not a single error. Thank you very much.